It's, it's a pleasure to be with you. My name is Joe Cirincioni. I'm the Senior Vice President for National Security and International Policy at a new think tank in Washington called the Center for American Progress. Um, this is the second video conference that we're having on the issue of uh, nuclear weapons and proliferation. What's these four threats? Nuclear terrorism, the existing arsenals, new states, and the collapse of the treaty regime that you have to worry about. And that's the kind of issues that I work on every day. Those are the kinds of things that keep me up late at night. The first and the most serious threat is that of nuclear terrorism. The possibility that some group could get a nuclear weapon or the nuclear materials to make that weapon and then detonate it. Uh, my question is, how hard would it be to make an IED, an improvised bomb, from an enriched uranium core? What you're talking about, you call it an IED, most people call it a dirty bomb or a radiological dispersal device. It doesn't make a nuclear explosion. It won't destroy a city or even kill a lot of people. But what it does is take a con something that terrorists know how to do, a car bomb or a truck bomb, and it takes that explosive and it laces it with radioactive material. Because a little bit of that, a couple of grams of that radioactive substance mixed together with about 10 pounds of dynamite could contaminate an area the size of most of your schools, about 10 city square blocks. It's this dirty bomb that a lot of us worry about as, as, as something that we're going to see in terrorist attacks. I was wondering, you said earlier that 100 nuclear weapons would uh, destroy the planet. And do you think we make so many just so we can stay on top by saying we have 10,000? Do you think our main goal is just to intimidate? We went from, um, oh, about 20 nuclear weapons in 1949 to about 20,000 nuclear weapons by 1960. We went to this crazy extreme where by 1986, there were 67,000 nuclear weapons in the world. 67,000. It is completely insane. There was no real justification for this. We've now walked back from that, and we've been cutting the forces ever since. We're down to about 27,000. But getting lower has proved to be a problem sort of politically and bureaucratically. All of this is very expensive weaponry. We spend about $23 billion a year maintaining our nuclear stockpile. It's an enormous amount of money. My goal is to get the next administration to commit to a reduction down to 600. I think we could save about $20 billion that way that we could use for many other programs. The third threat we face is that of new nuclear weapon states. Well, as far as U.S. policy is concerned and um, with preventing other countries from having nuclear weapons, uh, how uh, correct is it morally and politically to simply offer these incentives and take away their nuclear program when the U.S. has such a wide nuclear program? That's an excellent question. You have a very sophisticated understanding of this problem. How can we stop other countries from getting nuclear weapons when we have 10,000 ourselves? It's the basic fundamental problem that we faced for 60 years. It's like your parents trying to convince you not to smoke cigarettes when they have a two-pack-a-day habit and they keep talking about how good cigarettes are. It's not going to work. Uh, we were wondering, the North Korean dictator stated that um, he would take continued hostility as a declaration of war. I, um, how valid is this statement? Deterrence is the threat to use nuclear weapons against someone who uses them on you. Deterrence is what's kept the nuclear peace for the last 60 years. The fear that if you actually use one of these weapons, there would be retaliation against you. The real danger from the new nuclear nations is what happens in the region. What, what do North Korea's neighbors do? What do Iran's neighbors do? 
This is the way proliferation spreads. One country reacting to what its neighbor is doing. The final problem you have is the possibility of the collapse of the entire non-proliferation regime. This is a regime that liberals and conservatives and Democrats and Republicans have worked to build for 40 years. It's these treaties, these agreements, these arrangements that have slowed the spread of nuclear weapons, if not altogether stopped them. In 1998, Pakistan and India both performed a series of nuclear tests, um, almost leading to war be between the countries countries. Both countries received harsh responses and sanctions from the international community. However, only eight years later, Pakistan is considered a strategic ally of the U.S. and the U.S. has accepted, as some would say, India as a legitimate um, nuclear power and a, quote, strategic ally. Relating to the present crisis in North Korea, do you feel that perhaps a decade from now, the U.S. and the international community will eventually accept North Korea's nuclear power. History is very clear on this, that if a country is willing to stick it out, eventually the other countries adjust to it. Well, I was wondering whether the U.S. policy has in any way escalated the threat of nuclear war. Absolutely. I argue this all the time. It, you can't divide the world into good guys and bad guys and say the bad guys can't get the weapons, but the good guys can get the weapons. It's okay that Israel has weapons. It's not okay for Iran. It's okay for India. It's not okay for North Korea. Forget it. That's never going to work. We all got to do this together. We all got to walk down the non-nuclear path together. We have to be getting rid of our weapons if we want to convince other countries not to get theirs. That includes Israel. That includes India. That includes Iran. That includes North Korea. That includes us. That's the central problem. You have to have a universal agreement to one set of standards.